ahad allahu samad la mi lid wa la mi lad wa la mi akulahu kufun ahad I ask Allah to bless all of you for coming out on this cold night in remembrance of him and to uh, reflect your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by giving generously to your brothers and sisters who are in hardships and being helped by the MLFA and uh, after I was listening to the, to the dear Sheikh uh, and the other reciters this evening I was, I was reminded of the hadith of the Prophet peace be upon him when he said there are three reasons why you should love the Arabs one because I am an Arab, he said. Two, because the Quran is in Arabic. And three, Jannah is the language. Uh, Jana, Arabic is the language of Jannah, is that correct? I thought of two other reasons why we should love the modern day Egyptians. One, because of the way they recite the Quran, like we heard this evening. And two, because they make us laugh so much. Takbir! And really, we, you are known for the best humor in the Middle East. And let's be honest, you need some humor in the Middle East. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm here because I love this Ummah. Alhamdulillah. And I love my brothers and sisters. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts that love in the heart of all of us when we come to Islam. You may all have been born with Muslim parents, but that just means that you all know that one day you wake up as a Muslim and it's not the day you're born, it's when you sincerely make that first Salah that you mean. Not the one where your parents are going, make Salah. Or you're not going to the cinema tomorrow. The first real one that you make. So we're all reverts here to Islam. But I've only been a Muslim two years and I'll tell you now that if I walked into this mosque two years ago and saw myself now, I would look like this. No. What did they do to you? Because you see, I was never going to be Muslim. It wasn't in my life plan. And we're all so arrogant. We have these two-year plans, five-year plans, structured plans, insurance plans, and they're meaningless because Allah knows which direction we're going in and we do not know. So I want to share to you this evening, with you this evening, how I come to be standing here um, as your sister in Islam. And I will begin when, um, I will go back to my childhood. Because I grew up in a place called London in England. And my father is an actor, his name is Tony Booth. And my mother was a former model. She actually went out with Ringo Starr from the Beatles for a while. So we had a very theatrical home. And my father was a lapsed Catholic. He'd left the Catholic Church as an adult because of what he'd seen as a child. The nuns can be very vicious, or well, they could be in the 40s and 50s in schools. So he had no time for organized religion. In fact, the only time he mentioned God was when he was drunk and he would sing Catholic songs. My mother was superstitious rather than religious. So she might buy lots of crosses with Jesus on, she thought, and she'd hang them around our apartment to keep away evil spirits. But it's interesting to note that I never remember a time when I didn't pray. So what I'm saying is I always prayed. I remember being a little girl who would always go to bed and say, dear God, and then have a list of requests and then say, amen at the end. And I even remember one particular prayer I used to make all the time was about my younger sister. Dear God, please, 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 please take my younger sister away. She's really horrible. Alhamdulillah, she's still with us. And she got a bit nicer. So we are born with this natural recognition of God inside us. He puts it into us inside our mother's wombs and our society breaks that contact and does everything it can and shaitan gnaws away at our belief until we forget. And so it was with me. I went from being a very pious child, happy to pray, and then you get to around 10 or 11. And girlfriends from school come over and they stay the night and you have your jokes. And if you pray at 10 and your friend doesn't believe in God, she laughs at you. 
The first time that happened, a girl made a sound like this and looked at me saying, Dear God, please bless mommy and daddy. She said, What are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm praying to God. She said, Oh, the man on the cloud, the man with the big beard. What do you answer? If there's no faith in your household, if your parents aren't talking about God to you, if all your friends think it's a ridiculous idea akin to Santa Claus, where is the rope? Where is the rope? What rope are we giving our children? Not enough rope. Not the rope of Iman. So I slipped off the rope and I stopped praying. And then, of course, what happens next? I reached uh, 11, 12, 13. Hormones ego and then because it was that kind of environment I started taking drugs and alcohol and that was it the God who I'd so loved and trusted seemed to have moved away from me but what I didn't realize is he never moved I moved away from him he never left me I left him and what did I know about Islam growing up well I went to a North London girls' school, and there were three girls who were Muslim in my year. And I watched them from a distance, because we didn't uh, mix together. They had their own group, and I was in a different group. And I made uh, three ideas about Islam from watching them. One, I thought that all Muslim girls had black, shiny hair. Two, I thought all Muslim girls had to be good at maths and become doctors. Three, I was pretty sure that this Islam thing came from a place called Pakistan. And you know what? Until 9-11, that was pretty much all that I knew about Islam. Incorrect or correct, that was it. I had no other information at all. And I'd feel worse about that if that isn't still better than most of America today. What is the moment, <clears throat> I'm asked, what is the moment when you felt that Allah, I've got a bit of a dry throat, sorry. Water, water, water. <clears> throat> throat> yeah, I've got something. <clears throat> People want to know when you're a revert. What is the moment that you felt Allah changed the course of your life? And I've thought long and hard about which moment that was, and I've come to this conclusion. It happened in the year 2000. I had a new baby, my first daughter, and her name is and was Alexandra. And I was sitting in front of the television at night, watching the evening news with my one-month-old baby. And an image came on my screen that took all the breath out of me. All of the breath came out of my body. And all it was, was a back of a young man's body. And this young man was standing and the cameraman had been behind him. And he was holding a stone in his right hand. And he had jeans on and he was 15 years old. And his name was Faris Odeh. Faris Odeh came from a place I'd never heard of called the Gaza Strip. In a place that I kind of heard of called Palestine. And what was amazing about that photo was the strength of that boy's back. That stone looked like it had so much power in it, it could change the world. And he was about to throw it. And what was even more amazing was that just 10 feet away from him, five meters away from him was a tank. And the tank was pointing its gun at him. And Faris Ode had no fear in him because he had the mighty stone and the stone was gonna somehow stop that tank. And anyway, even if it didn't stop the tank, it was worth it because he was not going to let it go and hurt his mother or his sisters today. Now, what really moved me about that image as well, being a journalist at the time, was that the BBC voiceover 
the introduction they gave to this photo went something like this. Look at that lovely Israeli tank protecting all of us from that terrible ragamuffin Arab Muslim who's a danger to mankind. Thank God for Israel. I'm exaggerating, but only a little bit. That stayed on my mind. That changed my life. And that's the only reason, that and the Qadr of Allah, that I can give you for everything that has happened in my life next. In 2005, I was living in France. I had two daughters, a husband who was building our barn. We even had a swimming pool and we lived in the south of France. A lovely, lovely life. I knew I was lucky and I was very grateful. So tell me why I walked into my editor's office and said this in January 2005. Peter, I'd like to go to Palestine, please. Now, Peter Wright was my editor. He should have said to me, don't be ridiculous. You're not a war correspondent. You're not a political correspondent. You've never been to the Middle East. Go back to writing about being a mother and hairstyles. But when Allah has a plan for you, that plan will be fulfilled, no matter how strange the circumstances. Instead, my editor said, here's a check for all your expenses. I'll give you four pages of the magazine. See you in two weeks. A couple of days later, I was on a plane. I found myself outside Tel Aviv airport. All I had in my pockets were three phone numbers of names, Arabic names I could barely read. And they were going to get me an interview with a man called Mahmoud Abbas, who was about to be elected leader of the Palestine Authority. So there I am standing outside Tel Aviv airport. And a young man comes over to me and he says, hello, can I help you? I say, uh, yes, I uh, need to get a taxi. He said, well, my name is Jamal, but you can call me Jimmy. And I am a taxi driver, where do you want to go to? I said, I want to go to a place called Ramallah. He said, no problem, get in my cab. In the next 63, 65 minutes, Jimmy Jamal gave me 63 years of Palestinian history. <laughs> he was an amazing guide. It was like Occupation 101. Alhamdulillah. I remember as we got outside Jerusalem Al-Quds, how smart the roads are, how wide the motorways, and they get a bit smaller and they get a bit raggier the closer you get, and you go through what they call Area C, and then you get towards the checkpoints at Columbia. Now I looked on the hillside, and I saw an even better road. And this road had no cars on it. So I turned to Jimmy Jamal and I said, I don't want to tell you your job, but why don't we go on the hillside? We can have a nice view and it might be quicker. He looked at me and said, you don't know much about this, do you? I said, tell me. He said, if we go on this road up there, it's a Jews only road, so we cannot. But if I take you on this Jews only road, we will probably be shot dead in around five or six minutes. Shall we go on that road? He pretended to turn the wheel. They have a very weird sense of humor. It happens with occupation. I said, no, 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 don't take me up there. And a thought came into my head straight away about apartheid. We got to the checkpoint and Jimmy Jamal said, this is as far as I can take you. I said, what do you mean? He said, you have to walk through the checkpoint now get a taxi the other side to get to Ramallah. I said, why can't you drive through? He said, I'm not allowed. The Israelis have only given me a permit to say I live in Jerusalem so I can never go to the West Bank anymore and I can't go to Gaza. I said, but this is your land. He said, you don't know much about this, do you? I got out of the car in the dark, went through the checkpoint, got into another taxi 
And that night, in a Ramallah hotel, I cried myself to sleep. And what had I seen? Seriously, one checkpoint and one apartheid road. I really, really wish today that that was as bad as it gets. The next day I woke up and somehow I managed to, without really doing anything, get an interview with Mahmoud Abbas. Now, when you are meeting a, a world leader or a country's leader, you have to negotiate with their security. So if you want to meet, say, uh, Barack Obama, you have to go through uh, 20 or 30 different tiers of security, and you have to go through security with Mahmoud Abbas as well. So his final line of security with me, after they'd taken my handbag, men had taken my um, coat, and they'd taken my uh, phone, I was standing in a metal elevator with two of the biggest Arabs you've ever seen in your life. Six foot five, six foot eight. Both of them had guns. And they stood there like this, looking down at me, which isn't very easy. You can imagine how tall they were. And they both had walkie-talkies on, and one of them went like this. And the man picked it up and said, now, I'm not racist, but that's how, uh, that's how Arabic sounds to English people, I'm sorry. It's true. The Lebanese is slightly lighter. I stood there and I thought to myself, subtitle, we'll kill the white woman later. No, ha, ha, ha. I realized at that moment that I had Arabophobia. <laughs> that despite thinking I was open-minded, that I'd come to tell the truth never seen before, that I was going to be a fighter against oppression, I'd swallowed it all. The Israelis were me and I was the Israelis and we were Europeans and they were them and I'd never be them and they were scary and anyway, I had Arabophobia. They say that a week is a long time in politics. But brothers and sisters, I have to tell you that 72 hours in Palestine is a lifetime. And just three days later, after traveling around the area with any of the people that I met, I knew that I'd give my life for any man, woman or child that I met in Palestine. Such was the love, such was the generosity, such was the goodness and the honesty of every single person I met on that, on that trip. I'll give you an example. The Israelis had kept my suitcase for extra security. You may know this, they like security. So I had no winter coat. I was walking around an area called Manar, and it was a day like today, it was so cold. And an old lady, tiny lady, came up to me and she looked at me like I was crazy. And she grabbed my arm and she said, Yalla, yalla, yalla! <laughs> she pulled me along. I didn't know where I was going, but she didn't seem too threatening. She took me into her little house, and she just went up to a wardrobe and she opened it. And she took out a big coat, maybe it belonged to one of her daughters, I don't know. And she put it on my back. And she took out a little case, and she looked at me and she got some jumpers and she put some jumpers in the case. And then she closed the case with her phone number. And then she said, Assalamu Alaikum. And she ushered me out onto the street again. SubhanAllah. This is the generosity this is the, the loyalty and the open-heartedness of the Bedouins who came to Islam in the early days and were around the Prophet ﷺ. It made me think subsequently how, of course, the Quran came to the Arab people, of course, because there is that sweetest sweetness in their hearts. 
So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan for you, you can go to the left and the right of it, but the final destination is Qadr, and you will reach there. Now, after that trip, I was changed, but it wasn't about Islam. I just thought, I've seen some truth in the Middle East, but I didn't know where it was going to take me. And then I got a strange phone call. In 2007, a man called Muhammad Ali, who runs a channel called the Islam Channel, rang me and said I asked for a meeting. So I went to meet him at a London restaurant with his head of programmings, and they sat down, sat down opposite me. And I'll tell you how arrogant I was at the time, because we have to be truthful about these things. As soon as these men sat down, Muhammad Ali has a beard, he's clearly a religious man, I said to the waiter, waiter, can I have a bottle of wine, please? I did not care that they were religious, because I liked to get drunk at lunchtime, and they'd have to deal with it. It was fine that Muslims were in my country, they could stay. It was okay by me, but if I wanted to drink, I'd drink. Muhammad Ali looked at me and he said, I don't mind if you drink. You're not Muslim, it's your business. But there are two things you must know before you have your first glass of wine. One, the Islam channel isn't paying for it. <laughs> two, I will not be sitting at this table while you drink it. I will see you when you're finished. Now, Muhammad Ali did something very clever that day. He could have sat at another table, made phone calls, waited for me to finish a couple of glasses. That's not what he did. He went outside the restaurant, by the window where I could see him, and he walked up and down like this, waiting for me to finish. And a strange thing happened to me that day. I had a feeling I hadn't had since I was a child. I felt shame. I felt ashamed of myself. Why had I acted like that in front of someone religious? Why was I being so rude? All in order to have some alcohol. It didn't feel right. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us? If you feel no shame, do as you like. Feeling shame is an awakening of the heart. And I felt shame. I pushed the wine onto the next table and motioned for him to come in and we began the meeting and he said something that amazed me and perhaps it amazed him too. He said the words, we'd like you to be a presenter on the Islam channel. Imagine, imagine. I said to him, you know I'm not Muslim, right? He said, yes, I guessed. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, right, well, I consider working at the Islam channel because I like you people. <laughs> but there are two conditions before I accept any job offer. One, please don't try and make me Muslim because I'm never going to be Muslim. Muhammad Ali looked at me and he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows whether or not you'll be Muslim and you don't know. I said, no, 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 it's the other way around. I know whether I'm gonna be Muslim and Allah does not know. He said, no, 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 no. Allah knows and you don't know. I said, I know Allah. He said, Allah knows. And he said, okay, let's leave it at that. I said, the second thing is, don't ask me to wear hijab on your channel because I'm never ever going to wear hijab. Now, don't present Allah with definitives. Don't be arrogant. Do you remember a little ship called the, what was it, the Titanic? Yeah, the Titanic. Wasn't that the boat that would never sink? Well, I was the woman who was never going to wear hijab. How did that work for me? Alhamdulillah, he said, that's fine. You don't have to wear the hijab. For the next two years, I was sent around the world as a chief correspondent with the Islam Channel, interacting and interviewing some of the greatest scholars and clerics, some of the greatest Muslim thinkers and activists in the world today. One of the people that I met while working for the Islam Channel had a deep effect on me. And I'm so scared to say his name now because it's a room full of Arabs and I'm going to get this wrong. His name is Sheikh Raid Saleh. 
Right, Salva. Go on, all correct me. All at once, say it. Right, Salva. Salah, Salah, thank you. Right, Salah. Right, Salah is the Lion of Palestine. He is the leader of the, um, of the Islamic party in what is known as Northern Israel. One night I was in Copenhagen and I got to do an interview with him. I'd never heard of him. And he walked in to the foyer and up to me like this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I looked at him and thought, this is the lion of Palestine? Where's the roar? I had no idea that humility can also mean strength, that humbleness has a power to it, that modesty has a dignity to it. I didn't see any of those things at first. He took a seat opposite me and over the next hour he spoke in very strong, powerful Arabic and I had no idea what he said. But I felt a wave, a wave of Iman come over me from this man. And I didn't even know what Iman was then. I just knew that I was in, I was in the presence of greatness. Now when Allah has a plan for you, you will go in the direction of that plan, as I've said. So around this time, I made another visit to the West Bank and I visited Gaza for the first time for two days. And if I had more time, I'd love to take you through that trip because it was a very, very, very difficult trip. And it ended with a, an awful, an awful visit through the Erez checkpoint. The Erez checkpoint is such a place of hell that even the staunch people of Gaza, if you say Erez, they shiver. It really is a visit to hell. And I was disturbed by it. But the next day I was in Jerusalem and I was heading home via Tel Aviv and I had 40 minutes to get all of my souvenirs. And it was raining and I was walking through old Al-Quds. And suddenly a young Palestinian man started walking next to me. And he said, Marhabar. And I said, Marhabar. He said, how can I help you today? And I had a mean thought. I thought, I haven't got time for this. I'm busy. I'm in a rush. And then a better thought came to me. The people of Palestine have always made you welcome, shown you generosity. Whoever this young man is, you show him respect and you talk to him nicely. So I stopped and I said, I'm sorry, um, I've got a lot of shopping to do and I'm in a hurry. He immediately said, this is great news. All of these men are my uncles. We shall get everything you need. I said, okay, okay, okay. He said, what do you need? I said, my list is two toy camels for my daughters, a ceremonial knife for my husband, a Yasser Arafat mother of pearl portrait, and a Quran in English. I'm kind of interested if you have such a thing. For the next 40 minutes, we ran in and out of every shop in the old quarter. We drank so much mint tea, I think I got diabetes. <laughs> really, you have too much sugar in your tea. I'm not joking. It's wrong. <laughs> and at the end of it, 40 minutes later, I was out standing in the rain with two bags full of everything I'd asked for and a lot more. And I turned to the young man. And this is a young man, by the way, I've never seen before and I have never seen again. And I said to him, how much do I owe you? And he looked at me and said, nothing. This is all a gift from the people of Palestine. <laughs> and he added, don't forget us when you go. And that's how I got my first Quran as a gift from the people of Palestine. SubhanAllah. And you know, it's funny to think that Whenever you leave Palestine, whichever hellish checkpoint, whatever crossing you go through, there will always be a man, woman or a child 
crying and they will always say the same thing. Don't forget us when you go, right? Don't forget us. When Allah has a plan for you, you will go on the course of that plan. But I was still not on the road to Islam. I was just a political journalist and now I had a point of view and I was getting more active for the people of Palestine after the injustice that I'd seen. And then in 2008, I got another strange email. And it just said two lines. Would you like to go to Gaza by boat? Call this number. Would you like to go to Gaza by boat? I looked at the email. You have to remember in 2008, the siege, the illegal Israeli siege, was just over a year old. It was becoming clear that 800,000 children were being strategically kept on a minimum diet, near malnourishment, but alive, as Dove Wiseglass, who was the uh, Ariel Sharon's advisor, said, we'll put the people of Gaza on a diet, but we won't let them die. Astaghfirullah. Collective punishment. I looked at the screen many times, would you like to go to Gaza by boat? Call this number. I had two daughters, aged three and five. No way I could go to Gaza by boat. I looked at the screen and I called the number. And a voice said, hello, this is Osama. I thought, blimey. <laughs> I really don't want to go to Gaza by boat with Osama. It'd be the worst move ever. Alhamdulillah, it was a different Osama. <laughs> again, again I went into my editor's office and as if having an out-of-body experience, I heard myself saying, I want to go to Gaza by boat. He said, here's the money to go. We'll give you four pages of the magazine. I thought, maybe he just wants me dead. <laughs> Is it the end of my contract? In August 2008, I found myself in Cyprus with 45 other human rights activists. None of us were Muslim but none of us could live another day knowing that people were being persecuted in such large numbers and nobody was doing anything. The Free Gaza movement, by the way, was started in Los Angeles. One of the women who started it is Greta Berlin, American, former oil executive, couldn't bear to see what was happening. They founded it and a load of students and teachers and journalists and writers and nurses, we all just gathered on the docks and we looked at the two boats that were supposed to go to Gaza. I'm telling you, these were the worst boats you've ever seen in your life. We got really ripped off. Don't buy boats off Greeks you don't know. Little tip. The Free Gaza, which was to hold 23 of us on a 36 hour journey against the Israeli Navy, if you steered it left, it went right. If you put the, uh, the, the rudder forward, it went backwards. I'm not lying. I was only told a month ago that the steering wheel was on upside down. <laughs> the other boat, if you plug the fridge in, or all the electrics just died. No. <laughs> I'm pretty sure to this day the only way, the reason the Israelis didn't blow us up is because they were waiting for us to sink. <laughs> They're like, this is going to be perfect. We got on the boats on the 22nd of August 2008 and we didn't know if we'd make it to the other side. In the middle of the night, on a 36 hour journey where everybody had seasickness, except for me, alhamdulillah, there was a girl called Jenny who was driving for a bit, only this tall, captaining a ship on the high seas against the Israelis, God bless her. And the radio came on the emergency channel and this came on. Free Gaza, Free Gaza, Free Gaza. This is Israeli Navy. <coughs> Turn back, we don't give another warning. Turn back. And then Hebrew music came on. Everybody was asleep on the deck of the ship. I looked at her and I said, what do we do? She looked at me and said, there's only one thing we can do, Lauren. I said, what? She said, we might as well dance. 
<laughs> so we danced about to Hebrew music. And the next morning, at 11 o'clock in the morning, in the distance, suddenly we could see Gaza rising up out of a mist. And as we got closer, we could see dots on the horizon. And we looked and we thought, what are the dots? I don't get it. What are the dots? And we got closer and we realized there were thousands and thousands of people. The Palestinians, the men had waited three days sleeping on the beach around the port because they couldn't believe that for the first time in 44 years, human beings were coming on the sea to see them. And we weren't enemies. First time in 44 years. They looked out and it wasn't an enemy ship. And then we heard the sound, a wave of sound. It hit us. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It just went on and on and on. And as we got closer, children climbed up onto the boat. Everybody was swimming in the sea. Everything that could float in Gaza, including, I'm sure, a few kitchen sinks, floated up to us. And men, who you're supposed to be scared of, were weeping in public, praising Allah. And it was the greatest day of my life. Three days later, I was supposed to be going home. We were only meant to take some small amount of aid, break the siege, raise awareness and leave. Because we had no other way out. But for some reason, and I cannot explain this to you, I didn't get on the boat. All my friends were saying, Lauren, get on the boat. I said, I can't. Get on the boat. I said, I can't. And I watched my boats to freedom leave. And I stayed in Gaza. Three days later, I thought I could leave by Rafa because it was open to internationals. I'd seen more, I had a good idea of what the siege meant, and I was going to go home to my babies, and I was going to write about it. But when I got to the border, Rafa, the Egyptian Mubarak regime guard, picked up my passport like this and said, <laughs> Lauren Booth, you're not going anywhere. So what do you mean? He said, you're not going anywhere, go back to Gaza. I said, look, I've got a British passport. Internationals can leave today. You don't have the right. He said, look, the Israelis have told us if Lauren Booth wants to be in solidarity with the Palestinian people, let her live like the Palestinian people. Go back to Gaza, that's where you live. <laughs> My heart sunk to the ground like a piece of rock. My daughters, I didn't know if I'd see them again. I was terrified, but I want to tell you now, I thank Allah every single day of my life for allowing me to live under siege with the greatest Muslims alive in the Ummah today. Takbir! Allah. Allahu Akbar. Because I spent an entire month in Gaza and it wasn't my choice, I didn't plan it that way. And what was that month? Ramadan. Ramadan, when the gates of heaven are opened and the blessings are felt by the believers. But I wasn't a believer. I was just trying to do some work. I was just trying to do some good. One night, I went to a very poor family in a place called Rafa. Do you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works? Remember Faris Odeh, who I'd seen on television? Now I was in the TV. Suddenly I was in Rafa refugee camp and I was taking some meat to a poor family and I knocked on the door and I'll never forget it. The doorway was more bullet holes than cement. It was a crumbly, dirty little back street and a woman opened the door like this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Fadal, fadal. Now sisters, I love you all dearly for the sake of Allah, but I promise you, not one of you could give me a smile as beautiful as this lady gave me. She was so full of light 
Light came from her eyes, light came from her skin, light came from her smile. I know now that that is Noor. As I looked at her, I thought, maybe she's rich. Maybe behind this door, it's like Aladdin's cave, because there's no way that you can be this poor as everybody else is in this area and this happy. I walked past her, and what did I walk into? A cement room with nothing in it at all. Nothing. It was just an empty room. And all there was was a single rug on the floor. And on that rug was an iftar for maybe 15 people. And the iftar was a paper plate of pitta, a paper plate of hummus, and a paper plate of some salad leaves. And that was it. And for the first time since working with the Muslim community, I felt angry at the idea of Islam. And I turned to this woman and I said in a very harsh way, why do you fast in Ramadan? What is the point? I said, I don't understand it. You say, your God asks you to go hungry for 30 days. I say, you're hungry 365, so what? You tell me that your God wants you to go thirsty for 30 days. I say, you drink salty water 365 days, so what? Why do you fast? Why? This woman looked at me and she said, I fast to remember the poor. <laughs> Subhanallah. A woman who lived in a cement room and owned nothing in dunya felt rich. That night she had meat for her family so she was rich. That one night in Ramadan she had a visitor so she was rich and she was thanking Allah. And at that moment a key went into my heart and it opened. And a thought came to me, if this is Islam, right here, right now, I want to be Muslim. Because if this gratitude for so little is Islam, I want to be Muslim. If this humility before God is Islam, I want to be Muslim. If this care for other human beings is Islam, I want to be Muslim. But guess what, brothers and sisters? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the names he gives us for human beings is the forgetful. So many times in the Quran, he says, I remind you and you forget. Oh, mankind, you forget. So I walked out of her house, I said, Salaamu Alaikum, and I forgot about Allah. I forgot all about Allah. But you know what is beautiful? I forgot about Allah, He never forgot about me. He never forgot about me. And He never forgets about you either, no matter how far you go, Allah is with you, waiting for you to come back. It took another two years. I went back to sinning. I didn't give another thought to that feeling. I was drinking, I was smoking, I was being selfish. I was an unpleasant person who if I saw her now, I wouldn't. Actually, if I saw that person now, I hope I'd pray for her. <laughs> That's what I hope I'd do. But I wouldn't want to spend any time with her. I have to be honest, no. I went back to being that person. And in 2010, something else happened to me. I really, really wanted to go on an Al Quds Day rally. On Al Quds Day. So I went on the rally and I filmed it. And guess what month it was again? Ramadan. And on that journey, I went into a masjid. And when I went into the masjid, I made wudu and I cleansed myself and I made a small du'a and it was possibly my first ever du'a with sincerity and I remember it because of that and it was this Dear Allah, 
I didn't say God anymore. He wasn't God to me now, he was Allah. I said, dear Allah, I don't ask anything from you because you've given me such a good life, but please, 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 please bless the people of Palestine. And then I sat down. And when I sat down, I was a tourist. I just wanted to see the mums feeding the kids. It was Ramadan, I was being a bit nosy, you know? But when I sat down, it was as if I was under a waterfall of peace. SubhanAllah. A fountain, a fountain of contentment, tranquility. I couldn't feel anything. I felt totally calm. There was no pain in me. You know that voice, the voice you've even got in your head now? What time is it? Have I put, did I turn the washing off? How are the kids doing? That voice was silent. And I realized that that peace is what God has made the universe on. That the universe was made on peace and that we make all the problems in it. My friend said to me after a while, we should go now. And I said, I don't want to. I want to sleep on the floor here tonight. And that night I slept on the floor of the masjid. And in the morning I prayed Fajr. 2010. And seven days later, I walked into a masjid in London and I said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And I became Muslim. Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. And every day since has been a blessing or a test because that's what it is to be Muslim. And this Ramadan, my 12 year old daughter took her shahada, which is a blessing. And if you saw my 10 year old daughter in hijab, you would definitely say with her cute cheeks that that's a blessing. I say to her, are you Muslim? She said, I'm just practicing. <laughs> Which I think is so cute, I don't want to correct her. And one of the great lessons that I have learned, I want to share with you, and it's this, it's gratitude. We have so much. We have so much here that we have become blinded to how much we have. I was in Gaza in April, in a place called Bayat Hanun. Now Bayat Hanun, once upon a time, was a lovely little area of orchards and farming, farming families. But today, it's on the edge of Israel's buffer zone. So it's where the tanks come whenever they do an invasion. They come and wreck and smash and murder in Bayat Hanun. And I went to visit a family there whose situation is so awful, if you walked in, you'd be traumatized. I walked in to their garage, an empty garage where 15 children without shoes were living. Two mothers, one father. The father's taxi was broken so he could no longer support the family. They regularly didn't eat and it was a miserable situation. Now what they do in Gaza, as they must do in Syria now, is they don't introduce the children by names or by their skills. So if, you, if I introduce my daughter Alex, I'll say, this is Alex, she's great at maths. And then I'd say, this is Holly. Holly is, oh, Holly's naughty. <laughs> you know what the mothers of Gaza do? They say, this is Yusuf. He doesn't speak anymore because he has shell shock. The mother showed me her little boy. This, this is Yusuf. He has... Uh, white phosphorus burns up his leg. What is white phosphorus, by the way? Do you know? It's napalm with cancer. Napalm in the 21st century is called white phosphorus. It burns like little tiny bricks of fire through to the bone. And the little boy had that. Her older son, 16, had an Israeli bullet in his shin. Two of her daughters sat there rocking backwards and forwards. They didn't speak since 2009. It went on and on and on. It was Maghrib time. I went into the back room and I prayed. And when I made sujood, I started to cry. And I couldn't stop crying. And I couldn't even complete the prayer 
because I was just crying too much. And a mother mother came over to me and she said, are you okay? Why are you crying? Like she didn't know. I said, I'm crying because I hate this. I hate this for you. I hate that Israel is gonna keep hurting your children. I hate that you're going to be living in poverty. I hate that the world knows and they do nothing. I hate that I'm here and I can't do anything. And I hate this. I hate this. And this mother of Gaza looked at me and she said, but we're so happy. She said, we're so happy. She said, we have Allah. And Allah has promised us Jannah. And if we are patient and steadfast, all of us will go to Jannah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. We began this evening with Alhamdulillah for what Allah has given you. Let's end with Alhamdulillah. Ya Rab, Ya Rab, we thank you for everything you've given us, for gathering here tonight, for giving us the chance to remember our brothers and sisters in Sham, and all of our suffering brothers and sisters, if they are sick, bring them health, Ya Allah. If there is a sickness in our hearts, make our hearts healthy. Please bless all those who share their knowledge. Let us pass knowledge on to our community. Keep us safe and Ya Allah bless Syria. Amen. Assalamu alaikum. Now, how many of you enjoyed that story? Um, are you glad you came? Yeah. We're going to give you one more blessing. And that is to ask a few questions of Sister Lauren before she leaves tonight. So I will uh, ask, actually ask her to call on you. So before uh, everybody gets up and leaves, let's uh, give Lauren about 10 minutes to do Q&A. And we'll take uh, two or three questions from the sisters, two or three questions from the brothers. And she will call on you to uh, answer the questions. But Jazak So, I also want to say, please um, don't forget to fill in your pledge forms. I am only here to to for the pleasure of Allah because your brothers need